currently, uh, with the advent of the social media and in, more in general with the advent of Web 2.0, the amount of data produced, as well as the, the rate at which we produce this data, is increasing day by day. And uh, going through this uh, amount of data can be considered as a, a really big data problem because it appears to have the four Vs that characterize the big data, the big data problem. So using text in an effective manner is still a major challenge. And uh, uh, so even accessing, uh, so not processing them, but just accessing this data could be uh, difficult sometime. So why you should start a project in which you would like to process this huge amount of data uh, and have a lot of issues? So the response could be different because you can improve your existing services like uh, recommendation, for example, if you already use uh, collaborative filtering, you can improve the quality of your recommendation, integrating it with uh, content-based approach, but also you can use sentiment analysis to infer the, the people's feeling about uh, the, the things. And uh, in this way, you can improve, at the end, the quality of recommendation, mixing a collaborative filtering approach that is mainly item agnostic with uh, textual data that allow you to get new knowledge about, uh, from, the, from the data. Another interesting aspect is also that you can improve the quality of your search, because search can be considered as a, the most common way of using uh, uh, textual data. But we, here we are talking about relevance search, where the relevance is, uh, we can consider it uh, as the practice of improving uh, search results based on, uh, for the users, uh, satisfying his uh, uh, information needs uh, in a specific context of the user experience, uh, balancing uh, uh, ranking with uh, uh, business goals. So we can say that relevant search moves along uh, four different dimensions. Text, because obviously you need to reply with the right response. Users, because you know a lot about your users. You, can, you know his profile, he knows his uh, previous interaction, he knows his preferences. Context, because providing search for web search uh, or uh, uh, e-commerce is completely different, as well as providing search for specific domain like uh, medical or uh, healthcare domain. And the last one, uh, maybe the, the most important, is the business goal. Because uh, if you would like to provide search for e-commerce, you need to sell more items. So your business goal is driving your, uh, your search. If you would like to do a step more, for example, you can use uh, text analysis to provide uh, a more complex system in which uh, you allow people to just providing a query in normal, uh, in natural language, and the system that could be instructed with uh, an entire documentation can try to reply to the, to the, to the users, just trying to provide them the right response or a piece of information that could be useful for them to, to reply to, to the question. Or whatever you want, because when you start using uh, text, you can start thinking about a lot of way of improving your existing services or creating completely new uh, services. So in this scenario, we can say that natural language processing, uh, graphs, and uh, general machine learning algorithms could uh, help you to create an end-to-end -end framework that allow you to tame the beast, to manage this huge amount of data in the right way to extract new knowledge that could be useful for providing new type of services to your end user or increase the quality of your existing services. So with this idea in mind, we start uh, creating a new project that we called the GraphAware NLP uh, framework uh, with the idea of integrates already existing uh, NLP functionalities available in most common Stanford NLP or OpenLP framework with uh, uh, existing knowledge source like ConceptNet5 or uh, Alchemy API, WordNet and so on with our knowledge about graph, search and recommendation to create uh, a real end-to-end -end framework that uh, can offer from low to high level set of functionalities uh, um, uh, like uh, or services or uh, application that use the graph in the center of this infrastructure to uh, store data and to allow people to easily access to this, uh, uh, to this data. And since, uh, as I said, this need to be considered as a big data problem, we integrate also uh, Apache Spark uh, as a distributed processing mechanism to allow us to move uh, the grid part of the computation outside of Neo4j in a, in a way in which we can just 
use an entire cluster to provide uh, uh, computation. And since we would like to simplify a lot the, the work of the people that would like to integrate this type of tool, we are implementing a lot of, um, uh, let's say, integration plugin that allow, for example, to easily uh, use this software with Elasticsearch or with uh, Kafka or with uh, whatever is part of your uh, infrastructure. So since the beginning, uh, it uh, uh, appears to be a really complex uh, uh, goal. So we uh, started thinking to a new type of architecture in which uh, we uh, have the graph in the middle. So we called this architecture the graph-centric clockwise architecture. Because in the, in the center, we have the graph. And uh, every single feature, every single functionality, every single module just read data from the graph. And uh, once complete the processing, store data into the graph. In this way, we can keep each single module, but also each single functionality loosely coupled each to, uh, one to each other. And uh, in this way, we can just extend the, the architecture with uh, a lot of new features without having to take care of the previous existing uh, um, uh, modules. The clockwise means mainly that uh, since uh, NLP is a complex problem and you need to go through several steps if you would like to offer real advanced services, you need to think in the, in the clockwise manner. I think you need to start from the, from the first module and go through all or a part of them if you would like to go to, uh, to, would like to offer advanced uh, functionalities. So what, why we are calling, uh, are calling him a framework? It, because we are trying to develop not only a, a set of libraries, but also a, a way in which you can uh, uh, use complex stuff like Apache Spark or use uh, uh, Elasticsearch uh, simply running Cypher queries uh, uh, through the Neo4j. So you can define an entire end-to-end -end process just running uh, uh, Cypher queries into uh, Neo4j. And this is what I would like to show you. You can see the browser, yeah. So, for example, EI pre created some, some nodes. Uh, in this scenario, we have uh, uh, just news. So for each of these news, uh, um, we created uh, some, uh, we have some text take it took from the Wall Street Journal online. So what I would like to do is to show you how running some server query I can process and do interesting stuff with, uh, with this text. So uh, first of all, what I can do is to show you what, what type of text processing we have he here. So here I'm asking about the, uh, the list of text processor that I have available here. Uh, this is a, a plugin infrastructure, so you can deploy your own uh, uh, plugin for text processing. Now uh, we are uh, available only the Stanford NLP text processor and the Open NLP text processor. And uh, for, uh, for example, for the, the first one, we have several pipelines because uh, uh, for, in the case of Stanford NLP, we have the, the simple tokenizer, or we have uh, the, um, uh, a pipeline that allows you to extract not only token, but also sentiment, or to extract only sentiment, or again, to extract also phrases. And while for, in the case of uh, the open NLP, currently we are using only the, uh, the phrase pipeline because it seems that in uh, open NLP, we can uh, uh, have a better quality of the phrase extracted compared with uh, uh, Stanford NLP. So supposing that I would like to use uh, the Stanford NLP and just tokenize my set of news, I can run this query saying that uh, for each news, I would like to process the text and uh, I will assign the, um, the same ID that I have as a UUID for the, for the news uh, using uh, as text processor, Stanford text processor and uh, the tokenizer pipeline. I can create my own uh, also using uh, the, the Cypher query if, you, if I want, specifying, for example, uh, a different set of uh, stop words or a different, set of, a different number of uh, thread for running. Then I can run this. If I can, I will show you what is happening now. OK, now it, it, uh, the Stanford NLP is processing the, the text. It just complete, OK. So what I have now is that for each single 
new, I have uh, an uh, annotated text. If I click, I saw the, the list of sentences in order. And uh, if I click on the sentences, I get the, the list of tags with the um, tag uh, occurrence. For example, because these are the because this is not a simple uh, parsing. Uh, we uh, apply lemmification. Uh, we extract name entity. We extract part of the speech. Uh, and uh, for example, let me show you something like this one or like China, for example. Oh, you cannot see. Okay, now yes. Okay, you can see that it is recognized, for example, as a location. Now, what I can do now, for example, is that, yeah? How do you parameter tags? Uh, what do you mean? I mean, uh, uh, how do you know that uh, China is a location? This is done using the Stanford NLP. Stanford NLP has a name entity recognition tag that uh, is pre uh, uploaded into the into the system, it has, let's say, a sort of a uh, model that is that can be changed if you want, but uh, a predefined model that know that China is a location. If I get, uh, if I got a specific vocabulary, yeah. I have to implement it. Uh, yes, you can, or you can train it. There is a way in which you can go through the text uh, and uh, assign, uh, for example, to China location or whatever, and you can go through, there is a way in which you can train a new model using Stanford NLP, and this allows you to get your own without having to write to your own model. There is no way, no simple way to write a model in Stanford NLP, but you can train it in the way in which you want. So just providing a, every single word with a, what is for you, so you can. And this is true not only for name entity recognition, but also for, for example, Part of the speech recognition, that means that you can say, okay, this is a verb, this is a noun, this is a whatever you want, and so on. So if we want, we can do a little bit, a little step more. Now what I'm trying to do, hoping it works because it is on the network, is to say, okay, for each of the tags that I extracted, I would like to extend the information that I have accessing to ConceptNet 5. In the meantime, I can run it because it uh, requires time within this network. So what I'm doing now is to say, okay, for each node, that is for each annotated text, with a depth of just one, otherwise it will take a lot of time. What it's doing is to accessing it to constant five for each single tag and extract as much as information as we can. So for example, I will get that China uh, is a location and uh, is uh, in Asia or uh, for each single there is also a news regarding Orlando, for example, so I can get that Orlando is in Florida. So I'm extending the amount of information that I just extracted from the text with the new data coming from external sources, in this case, uh, with, uh, with ConceptNet 5. It's taking a lot, okay. Pardon? Yeah, what you can do is that you have a, a really suitable way in which you can store your data. Because uh, now we are only, let's say, first of all, you have uh, an easy way in which you can navigate this data, for sure. Second, what I'm doing now is to, okay, this is useful for some stuff that I will show you later. But okay, I would like to extend this information with other information. In this way, I don't have to take care of my previous model or whatever. I'm just adding new information because, as you can see now, for example, okay, this is different. Wrong example. I can click on uh, gunman, for example, and I get is related, or I would like to find Orlando, for example. As, okay, now I get that Orlando is in Florida because it's, if I click, no, you cannot see. If I click here, part of Florida. So 
Why this is useful? Because, uh, okay, now I have new information. What I can do is that when uh, I can start computing similarities between uh, uh, documents, but if you don't use this information, okay, and you get a couple of documents, one uh, regarding uh, something up, uh, happened in Orlando and something else happened in uh, Miami, for example, and you compare these documents, you will not find any relationship between them. But if during a comparison, during cuisine similarity, for example, I take into account that Orlando is in Florida, I will discover that these uh, apparently not related document will be the, in some way related because both of them apply. In a, but this is just an option. So uh, time is running, I think. Yeah. Just last thing. What I would like to show you is the integration with um, with Spark. Here I I run it in the meantime. Here I'm trying to clusterize the the news in four different cluster. I'll run uh, only 30 iterations, uh, and uh, I will uh, uh, get three words for each topic. So what I get is this. What is interesting is. It, the interesting part is that we integrate in a seamless way Neo4j with Spark, so I, it was too fast for me. But as you can see from here, we, these are a Spark processes running on, uh, on Spark. I can show also this one. Okay, it's just running now. And uh, uh, what we get is uh, automatically inferred topic for the, uh, for the news. And for each news, I get three words that describe, in some way, the, the topic and describe the, the, uh, the documents. That's all. Any question?